What's the person from Wyoming doing on something called the oil spill? I can tell you that the oceans have more to do with the weather in Wyoming than any other single thing. There is no input signal. That's what people used to tell me all the time. <laughs> Aha. I'm going to talk about a technology called geographic information systems that underpin the oil response and recovery. And for the young people who are here and who've asked questions all along, my first comment back to you as well to everybody else is the world is run by those who show up. If you want to know what you can do, if you're depressed, it's because you have no hope. What we want to do is offer you hope through information systems. GIS for the oil spill is more integrated and more filled with data than ever before for the public, for NGOs, for individuals as well as federal agencies, the Unified Command, which is the ostensible entity in charge, uh, BP and others, the State Emergency Operations Centers, because there are a whole variety of activities going on that can't be knit together unless there's something, in this case the technology, to enable timely decisions. Communication and coordination are much better in this disaster than ever before because communication has always been a problem. It's better, but it's only as good as the people and the media. This is the common operating view that the Unified Command has. By the way, I was told that to show up looking like a governor. I'd rather show up looking like somebody who knows how to go to work. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the Unified Command has a wealth of information at their fingertips. The resolution on this screen is, is not as good as I would like, but it gives you a visual of how the wealth of information is out there for responders, for overflights, for closures, recovery, tracking work, oil booms, boats, oil plume, wildlife, the JIC or the Joint Information Center and, and much more than that. The Incident Command coordinates NOAA overflights. They fly over the oil spills, anything else that's out there. By the way, there's the vein that was talked about earlier, the Mississippi Delta. The arrows on here depict the, the uh, NOAA overflights that look at the plume. Tasking of the onshore impact assessment team is done through the Unified Command. The uh, lines that are on there are drawn to represent the oil booms as to where they're supposed to be placed or where they are placed in and verified by, by photography, either aerial or space-based. We have almost near real-time field reporting for the people who are in charge, and they are of every type. It's not just one unified command. It's not just one BP. There are so many operational centers, but we are feeding them information better than ever before. The analysis of boom placement, where are they needed and how successful are they? If they're not successful, somebody should take a picture and turn it in, and I'll talk about that in a minute. The damage assessment, the encircling of an oil slick, whether it is to be accumulated or burned. Uh, from what you've seen already, there's the, the jury is out on the, the effective dispersal, whether by burning, burning or dispersal or whatever. I will talk also about how widely spread the operational info information is, the planning that needs to go into it. An incident commander in the past always spent on a 12-hour day at least six hours trying to find out what was going on in the field so they could adjust their strategy for the next day and make it happen. With the information and the technology that's available today, and I stress available, it, it depends on whether or not it's used, that incident commander can spend almost his or her entire time planning and operating and deciding what to do and strategizing for the next step. It also provides for a tremendous resource for allocation of what's out there and then the accountability for the monies that are being spent, whether they're shore vessels in a task force, the vessels that are out in the sea. By last count, there were over 6,000 vessels that were being tracked through this uh, technology. This is a NASA MODIS satellite view of the Gulf oil spill taken a couple of days ago. This type of imagery is incorporated then into that incident command activity to show them what's gone on, what's going on, so it gives a time condition a time-based condition, whether it be for elected officials, tactical briefings, community briefings, or just ordinary people. I'll come back to this one in a minute. This is the Florida Emergency Operations Center, and it's a very active website because it, the technology here was somewhat limited. I'm going to summarize at the end with some of that technology. Handheld devices are being used more than ever, from iPods to iPads to uh, Trimble to all kinds of equipment to document work status, both by photography as well as by typed-in input or other means to identify location of problems for damage assessment, the cleanup status, even if it has to recur day after day in this kind of activity. If something is going on that needs to be documented by photo, it can be done immediately through a mobile update 
uh, for whatever kind of activity is going on, whatever kind of equipment or personnel, especially wildlife by species and location where they can be relocated based on the information of the type of habitat they should be in. Public engagement is very important. Public interest, social media, crowdsourcing, new, news media in general. I'll come back to this again. It's the social media site where anybody can post anything about it, whether it be for uh, Twittering, YouTube, Ushahidi, anything that can document and link to a location of what's going on at that site. And I emphasize the geography is the important part, so you can reference it on the map, but it's more than a map, it's the ability to pull up a variety of information on rehabilitation. Where was the pelican picked up? Where will it be relocated? Where is the cleaning station? Where can the volunteers go to be matched up with their skills? This is the one from Louisiana. The economic impacts, I'll come back to this in my live demo. The Gulf of Mexico oil spill economic impact. What are the three major industries? Fishing and seafood, recreation, tourism, boating and shipping. The oil spill timeline that the media uses. The Joint Unified Command has its own YouTube posting, but there are other things on YouTube that can be posted as well. One of the things that GIS enables today is analysis and modeling. It's more than just posting something on a map. It's saying what could happen, what might happen, or under these conditions, is there something that can be done? The uh, spawning areas, mitigating impact for plants and habitat, NGO support, NatureServe has the best biological diversity database that's been incorporated into all the technology feeds that we use. Using a reference map where we have the political and street map boundaries, you can see the ocean currents as depicted by NOAA. This is sourced from them. What you don't see on this map, if I change, until I change to an aerial view, is there are fragments of the oil plume taken just a couple days ago that are scattered around this interior swirl that could make its way out into the loop current. They haven't yet, but they could. So modeling is important. This is a NCAR model of how that spill could go around into the Atlantic. It will miss, probably miss uh, Petersburg St. Pete, <laughs> Tampa St. Pete. Simulations of oil at various depths. This is from NCAR and UCAW, the University Center for Atmospheric Research. I'm gonna switch with what little time I have left to a couple of real interesting uh, presentations. This is the uh, <coughs> Emergency Operations Center in Florida, it has green, which is cleaned up or routine priority, which is important and high priority emergency recon reports. If I take that off the screen and I highlight and mouse over different activities that are here, we can see which ones are in need of work, which ones have been cleaned up, and which other ones need to be attended to. There's, uh, I don't know what happened to the rest of these. This is the, uh, the social media site that, that can be used, a timeline map, in this case the ability to go from when the oil spill was first being documented out until, well, day, the day after today. These are all coming from a NOAA feed. If we want to make the oil spill disappear, here's how you do it virtually. <laughs> because of the uh, the limitations of the technology here. I'm going to have to do a quick backward jump to my PowerPoint. I have just a couple of quick slides to finish up and the minute and a half that I have left. These are the, these are the offshore oil platforms as documented by NOAA. That's where the site is of the one they're interested in. Is that the only one? No. That's the number of oil and gas wells that are in the Gulf. Those are the pipelines that connect them. I don't know that people understand just that magnitude of the effort that's out there. If you don't have the information, how can you make a decision? If you knit that all together, you can see one of the pipelines goes all the way over to Florida, way over here, because that's where they get their feed for their petroleum refineries. With all this impressive information, presentation, and coordination, what could be missing? I, I call, recall what Philippe said. We need an integrated ocean information system. We need an earth observation system. We don't have those systems in place. We have 10 different federal agencies, each working on the ocean, not in a coherent way. The best way they work together is during a crisis. Why should we wait for a crisis to make things happen? We have a great shortage of information for a very long recovery. We will probably have recovery fatigue before we take the right action. 
the best we, thing we can do is show up and say, why don't we have the right sensors in the right place at the right time so we know what's happening before a situation comes up. We can, ha we can have the systems that develop the knowledge out of data and information to lead to decisions and action, but if we miss the data, if we miss the information through those sensors, we miss it all. So whether it's an oil spill or a climate change, we need those observing systems and we need people to run them. We need people who are young people to take on math, science, the professions that help us understand how to do the research, do the in, uh, obtain the information, and we need the leaders who are willing to show up and develop a coherent, that means together, a collaborative vision strategy for our future. I thank you and I would say in, in closing, it's, it's not our earth, it's what we borrow from our children and ours. Those are seven of our ten grandkids. Thank you. <laughs>